to continue with the last slide of, uh, set of slides, we're going to do photosynthesis in the pentose phosphate pathway, also known as the pentose phosphate shunt. And so this is going to cover how we convert, not necessarily humans, but organisms, convert CO2 into a more reduced form, in the form of carbohydrates, using photosynthesis. And we're also going to talk about the pentose phosphate shunt, which is a way of converting five carbon sugars into six carbon sugars and three carbon sugars, and of course vice versa, that converting those three and six carbon sugars back into five carbon sugars. Why should we do such a thing? Well, we're going to need five carbon sugars. We're going to need five carbon sugars for making new nucleic acids for ribose and deoxyribose. And at the end of this series of lectures, we'll talk about how we make the deoxyribose. And we also need to convert those, since we get them as food as well, into six carbon sugars right, to continue more uh, production of glucose. So we'll, we'll see how those interconversions take place at the end of the slide set. So let's start with the photosynthesis. As we did with the mitochondria, we're going to do a similar approach. The first thing we'll do is talk about the overall mechanism, what's going to happen, and then the anatomy of the organelle that takes place. Of course, this takes place in bacteria as well, some bacteria, where there's not an organelle, it is the entire organism, right? But it's essentially the same process. So what we're doing here is taking CO2 and reducing it to the state of a carbohydrate. At the same time, we're taking water and oxidizing it to O2. So it's essentially a, a simple redox reaction, but it's not so simple after all, right? Turning water into O2 is a very difficult oxidation reaction, right? So we're going to need some input of energy here, and it won't be in the form of ATP. The goal here is to not use ATP, right? So we're going to use the energy from radiation, from photons of light, to provide the energy for this reaction. And so once we convert those CO2s into a more reduced carbohydrate, then we can store it as glucose and starch and other carbon sugars for the plants and other photosynthetic organisms to use in the absence of another food source. Some of those organisms also eat things, right? They engulf other bacteria, for instance, or it might be a, a photosynthetic yeast cell or something like that. It could eat other things, but in the case of plants, they generally don't. And this is the only way they can convert some form of energy into a usable molecule, right? So we'll see how this happens in chloroplasts, in plants as the example, but this could also be true for a bacterial cell. So let's compare the anatomy of our, our chloroplast at the bottom to what we already knew about mitochondria. So a way to approach this is to correctly go from the interior to the exterior, because those are be synonymous things. They don't have the same names, don't associate outer membrane with outer membrane because that will not be true. We're going to associate the innermost space with the innermost space. And as we go from inside to outside, eventually reaching the cytoplasm, we'll see we have equivalent structures, barriers, and spaces. Okay? So from the inside out, let's remind ourselves what the mitochondria look like. The very interior of the mitochondria was called the matrix. Right? That is a volume. It's a space. It's called the matrix. The first barrier you reach would be the inner mitochondrial membrane. And that was the very important membrane. That's where all the action took place. That's where we pumped the protons across. That's where ATP synthase was. That's where the ADP ATP translocase was. So all the important things were in that inner mitochondrial membrane. So the barrier between the matrix and that first space we encounter after that, the inner membrane space. Okay. So we had a, another space called the inner membrane space. Then the next barrier we run into is the outer mitochondrial membrane. Okay? And that really wasn't a barrier per se because it had pores in it and holes in it and things could interchange between the two. And then the next space after that would be the cytoplasm. Okay, let's do that same analysis for a chloroplast. Starting in the very interior would be the thylakoid space. That's the interior of all these little green thylakoid membranes. Okay, so the space inside of these things is the thylakoid space. That is equivalent to the very interior of the chloroplast, or sorry, of the mitochondria in the matrix. Okay, so it's the most interior space. The first barrier we encounter would be called the thylakoid membrane. 
Okay, that's equivalent to the inner mitochondrial membrane. It's where all the action is going to take place. Okay, for the pumping of protons and, and all the other stuff, the electron transport chain and so forth. All that takes place in the innermost membrane. In our case here, it's the thylakoid membrane. In the case of mitochondria, it was the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay, so once we pass that barrier, we encounter another space, another area, a volume, and this one's going to be called the stroma. Right, so the stroma is the next area or space we were running into, which would be equivalent to the intermembrane space in a mitochondria. Okay, the next barrier we encounter is actually the inner chloroplastic membrane that's shown in blue on the right. So the inner chloroplastic membrane is the next barrier. That's equivalent to the yellow outer mitochondrial membrane shown on the left. It's the second barrier from the inside. Those are equivalent membranes. Beyond that we have another space between the inner and outer chloroplastic membranes called the intermembrane space. There is no such space in mitochondria, we're now in the cytoplasm. So the last barrier we encounter in the chloroplast, it has a third membrane, which the mitochondria do not have, is the outer chloroplastic membrane, the one shown in yellow on the right. Mitochondria have no such third outer membrane. Okay, so there is no equivalent in mitochondria. So do not equate outer membrane with outer membrane. That is not true. The outer membrane has no mitochondrial equivalent. The inner chloroplastic membrane is equivalent to the outer mitochondrial membrane. And the thylakoid membrane is equivalent to the inner mitochondrial membrane. And the spaces correspondingly go from thylakoid space, same as matrix, stroma, same as intermembrane space in the, the mitochondria. And then, of course, there is no extra membrane around the mitochondria, so the inner membrane space of chloroplast is unique. There is no such space in the mitochondria. And of course, the exterior to all of them is the cytoplasm. Okay, so the important membrane here is going to be our thylakoid membrane. That's the one we're talking about this whole time. Okay, and it separates the thylakoid space, which is inside of that, from the stroma, which is outside of that. Okay, that's the area we're going to talk about. Okay, so what are we doing with photosynthesis? Let's, let's see what the overall reaction is going to be. Well, we said we're going to take the photons of light is our energy source. It's going to oxidize water, so we're going to extract electrons from water. That's what oxidation means. So we're going to turn water into the oxidized form of water, which is molecular oxygen, O2. And it, we take those electrons and send them down an equivalent electron transport chain. It's not the same players. Some of them are the same. But it's a series of carriers of those electrons. That should sound familiar. Until we ultimately give them to someone. Now, we wouldn't want to give them back to oxygen to make water because that would be wasteful. We wouldn't get anything out of it. When we extract these electrons, I'd like to keep them. So we'll send them down a chain. And as we send them from one carrier to the next, as shown by the little yellow uh, bubble here, we send it from one carrier to the next, just like we did in mitochondria. We're going to pump some protons across the membrane. Okay? The only difference here is the pumping of the protons is in the opposite direction. We're going to pump them into the interior, not out. If you remember in mitochondria, we pump them from out, or sorry, from inside to outside, from the matrix to the inner membrane space. Here we're going to pump them in. We're going to pump them from the stroma into the thylakoid space, across the equivalent membrane. The, from, in the mitochondria, it was the inner mitochondrial membrane. Here we're talking about the thylakoid membrane. Okay, so. We're doing lots of the same things. The light source is the, the energy input. We're oxidizing water, so that's the opposite direction is what we did before. We're going to pass the electrons down a bunch of carriers, ultimately give it to a molecule of NADP+. This is slightly different from NAD+. It has an extra phosphate. That's why the P is there. And it reduces it. We're going to have to give it two electrons, of course. We're going to reduce it to NADPH. Okay, and at the same time, Passing it along those things, pump some protons into the thylakoid space. So we're going to build up a concentration gradient of protons, just like we did before, but it's on the interior this time. And so the protons are going to want to get out of that space, crossing the thylakoid membrane again, and we let them through an identical ATP synthase, the thing on the right here. 
So crossing that membrane across ATP synthase in an identical manner makes ATP. Three protons come across, it turns 120 degrees, we make an ATP. Everything's identical about it, except the orientation in the membrane. It's pointed out now instead of in. The benefit to this is the ATP being made is not trapped inside of that membrane anymore. It's outside, it's in the stroma, where we want it. So we don't have to pay to ship it. Right? So there's no shipping and handling costs here. So our main products of photosynthesis are the two things highlighted in yellow here. NADPH, which is the sink of all those electrons, right? NADP plus was my electron sink and it reduced NADPH. I've collected all those electrons and production of ATP. Those are my two products. O2 is a waste product, right? It's the, it's the, the garbage left over after we oxidize the water molecule. We throw it away as O2. And in fact, for most organisms, when this was first invented, photosynthesis, O2 was a toxic byproduct, right? And it eventually killed most of the organisms on the planet because they weren't ready to handle all the O2, which is a very oxidizing molecule. Okay, so what we'll do is use light, remove the electrons from water. We'll talk about how that reaction takes place in detail. Those electrons are passed down a chain, eventually given to NADP plus to make NADPH. And the NADPH is then used to reduce things later. So we're going to reduce some CO2 later to the alcohol stage. So from a carboxylate to an aldehyde to an alcohol, right? So we're going to use it as a reducing equivalent, reducing potential. There's no CO2 involved in the beginning here. We're just acquiring raw materials in ADPH and ATP in order to do that reduction of CO2 later. That's going to be in our Calvin cycle. We'll talk about those later. Okay. Along the way, we're also going to pump some protons, which allows me to generate that gradient and make the ATP. Okay. So let's talk about the first part, the light energy. So these are photons of light that come in, and some molecule has to absorb that light. When a molecule absorbs a photon of light, it can do several things. Right? One of the things is an electron gets promoted to a higher orbital. Right? You learned this back in general chemistry or physics, or wherever you learned it, uh, perhaps even in biology. So an electron is absorbed by an atom, and one of its electrons gets promoted to a higher energy state, or an orbital. It's an excited state now. Okay, so the diagram at the top right shows that when the photon of light is absorbed, it has to be the right energy photon, not any photon will do. It's going to be the exact corresponding energy difference. It'll promote that electron of the paired electrons in that orbital into an excited state. The simplest thing that can happen is that electron decays back to the ground state and this atom emits another photon of light. Right? That's called fluorescence. Right? The emitted photon is of slightly less energy than the one it was incident upon it, but that's just a simple fluorescence. That's not very useful unless you want your plant to glow. Right? So what we're going to do instead is when that electron decays back to its ground state, instead of it falling back into the same ground state, we transfer that electron to a different atom. So the electron has been moved to a different atom. How do we accomplish that? So at the bottom we have what's called photo-induced charge separation. Sounds like a long word, but all we're doing is using the energy from light to move an electron away from another electron. Right? We're having charge separation. So here our Electron gets excited, as you see at the bottom. The excited molecule, the electrons moves into the excited state. Instead of it decaying back down to the ground state in that atom, there's an acceptor molecule nearby, which has its normal ground state appearance, right? Two electrons in a lower state. We're going to transfer this electron to the other atom. Well, of course, it can't decay into the ground state. It's fully occupied. So we end up with an excited electron that can't decay any further. And of course, since you gained an electron, you've gained a negative charge. The donor molecule is now missing an electron, and it has a positive charge. Both of these are now radicals at the moment. So we don't want to let this stay as is. We need to either do this again and pair that electron with some another one, or pass them along to someone else. And we're going to do both of those things. Okay. So because the energy of the photon has now been transferred into this higher energy state of the electron, we don't release any more photons when this occurs. We just move the electron on. So the energy from the photon, right, because light has energy, has been used to ch pull this electron away from other parts of the atom. So we've induced this electron to move to another atom 
by the energy of the photon. Right? Not any atom will do, not any wavelength of photon will do. We'll talk about those in a second. Okay? So what molecule would be best to absorb the photon? Well, that totally depends on the photons that are present. Right? If I only had UV radiation present, a molecule that does not absorb UV would be a terrible idea. If you only had infrared light available, a molecule that absorbs infrared light would be best. So what light reaches the surface of the Earth and it's plentiful, right? Well, solar radiation reaching the Earth occurs maximally in the visible range. Right? There's lots of other wavelengths that they get here as well. They're just not as abundant as the visible range, which is a good explanation of why our eyes and other photoreceptors on the planet have evolved to recognize visible light more than any other, because that's the light we receive. Had we been around a different star, our eyes would be different. Okay, so the solar radiation that reaches the surface of the Earth is mostly visible light, right, what we call visible light. It, it stretches beyond a human visible spectrum into what we call a little bit of the UV and a little bit of the infrared, but outside of that range it's much, much less abundant. Okay, so organisms have evolved molecules that absorb light best in that range. And an example of that is the chlorophyll molecule. So shown the structure at the bottom, we have chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. These should look familiar to you. We've talked about a similar molecule to chlorophyll. Imagine replacing the magnesium in the center with an iron atom, and this would be a heme group. Okay? Heme's found in lots of other things, like hemoglobin, where it carries oxygen for us, or it's found in the electron transport chain of mitochondria, where it carries electrons for me. Right? So if I replace the iron with a mag magnesium here, now this thing can still accept electrons and be excited by photons of light right? and do it like they did in the electron transport chain, pass along electrons. The reason it looks green is because of the magnesium and the wavelengths of light that it accepts. Right? So if you look at the top right, we have a spectrum there with the extinction coefficients of these molecules. And the higher the peak here, the more of that wavelength light it absorbs. That's all this graph is telling you. So four to 700 nanometers, that's our, our visible range. And you see it absorbs fairly well at the extremes of the visible range. And the blues on the 400 to 500 range, which is slightly into the UV as well. And in, into the reds at the six to 700 nanometer range. But in the middle, where we have yellows and greens and, and yellow oranges, it doesn't absorb very well, right? So we see those wavelengths of light from organisms that are photosynthetic because they have chlorophyll. It's very rare you're going to find a blue plant. This is why, because the blue wavelengths of light are absorbed well. It's also less common to have a red plant, or a very red plant, because those wavelengths are also absorbed. The most common you're going to see are greens and yellows in the center. Okay? So looking at the structures of chlorophyll A and B, can you see why this thing absorbs light so well? All right, look at chlorophyll A. If you could focus only on the double bonds, you notice that every single double bond, well, that's a bad way to say that, I guess, every occurrence of a double bond is conjugated to another double bond. Right? So if you look in here, you see a double, single, double, double, single, double, everywhere. Right? And those are very stable arrangements. And because they're conjugated, the pi orbitals overlap. And overlapping pi orbitals act as a single large network of pi orbitals. This is why benzene rings are so stable. So we have this huge pi orbital network that overlaps, and the more overlapping you get, the lower energy light you can absorb. Right? So if you only had one or two double bonds, you'd be in the, the far UV range absorbing. But if you put several double bonds together, you can get up into the blue light. And if you put many more double bonds together, you can occur in the, the red light range. Right? If you have a really long one, you can get into infrared. So this has the right number of double bonds to absorb in the visible range. Right? And you notice chlorophyll A and B have a slight difference. I've circled it for you in blue. Right? The only difference being that methyl group at the top of chlorophyll A is a formal group in chlorophyll B. Right? So it's, it's a, a methyl group here and a formaldehyde here. So it's just a two oxidation state difference. But because of this extra double bond, which is conjugated to the rest of the network, it absorbs in a slightly different wavelength range. So chlorophyll A, you notice its peaks up here are slightly different than chlorophyll
field B because of this extra double bond. Right? Why do that? Well, having one chlorophyll molecule would be great for absorbing light, but if I have a slightly different chlorophyll alongside A, I have B, I have effectively doubled my range of photons that are excitable, right? that can excite my electrons. Right? So now I've got a wider range. Right? And these aren't the only ones. Besides chlorophylls, we have other molecules like carotenoids. Right? This is the reason why in the fall, in tropical, or not so tropical, but temperate regions, you have those fall colors. Right? When deciduous plants start to degrade, their leaves are dying, the chlorophyll molecules are degrading, we see the background of colors from the carotenoids, which are already always there. They're just not as abundant as the chlorophylls. So when the chlorophylls are degrading, we start to see the carotenoids in the background. So the, the reds and oranges and yellows starting to show. They absorb very well in the four to 500 nanometer range down in the, in the blues. So we, they don't absorb very well in the reds, so we see them as orangish, yellowish, red molecules. Yeah, so between the chlorophyll molecules and these carotenoids, we cover a wide range of the visible spectrum that can power photosynthesis. Okay, so we're going to use that information to see where does this energy go. So if you look at the bottom left, we have this antenna basically of all these molecules. This is inside of the chlorophyll, or sorry, the uh, chloroplast. We have this antenna, this array of molecules that are just waiting to absorb light. With all these double bonds, it absorbs light in the visible range. And when it does, it excites an electron. It passes that, or the electron decays back to the ground state. It passes that energy, not an electron, but passes that energy. This is called FRET. Uh, it was on a previous slide. I had a definition for it. It's fluorescence, resonance, energy transfer. It passes the energy of that photon to a neighboring molecule. And that one gets excited. The electron goes up into an excited state. It decays as well to a ground state, releasing yet another energy to the neighboring molecule. No electrons have been transferred yet, so it just hops around in this antenna from molecule to molecule until it reaches the center. And the center is at a slightly lower energy than all the rest, so it tends to funnel there. So this random walk occurs across it until it finally reaches the reaction center, which is a special pair of chlorophylls held in a slightly different manner so that it's a slightly lower energy. So the photon energy that reaches there doesn't leave, doesn't transfer to molecules around it. So this extensive antenna collects photon energy and funnels it to the reaction center. Right? 2,500 chlorophyll molecules could get excited and will only generate one reaction, or four reactions, but one O2 will be generated with all that excitation. So it's not exceedingly efficient, but if you think about how many photons hit that leaf per second, and this is just one tiny chlorophyll molecule, a chlorophyll array, inside one chloroplast, which has millions of these things, it takes a very dim light for this to occur. And if in bright sunlight, this recurs rapidly. Okay, so if we look at this system overall, I'll show you the parts of where we're going. We'll talk about each one individually. We have two photosystems, right? They're called photosystem one and photosystem two. We're going to talk about photosystem two first. Not because it was discovered first, it wasn't. Photosystem one was described first. But photosystem two occurs first in the time frame of things, right? It's the beginning of the pathway. So let's talk about photosystem two. This is where that array is. This is where all this reaction is taking place. This is where we oxidize water to O2. This is where we extract those electrons from water. And we're going to pass them along a chain. So this is where it all begins. Light inc incident light excites something. We extract some electrons from water. Now, we'll go into detail how that happens in a few minutes. And we make an O2 byproduct. We've oxidized the water. Those electrons are then passed on to other members of the system. Right? And you notice in the diagram up here, it goes from photosystem 2, the electrons, to this little bread-shaped thing here. It's called cytochrome BF. And if you want to think of cytochrome BF as equivalent to complex 3, of our electron transport chain. It's almost identical. Right? So to pass the electrons from photosystem 2 to cytochrome BF, which is our complex 3 analog, you see it doesn't leave the membrane. That means the electrons are being carried 
by a lipid soluble carrier. And it's our old friend Q, it's the same Q as before. This was just a chloroplastic Q versus a mitochondrial Q. Otherwise, they're identical. You can think of it as the same Q, right? So our quinones are going to transfer our electrons from photosystem 2 to cytochrome BF. So same Qs are doing a lipid soluble transfer. Right. Cytochrome BF, just like complex 3, is going to pump some protons for me as the electrons pass through, which is convenient to memorize. And then just like in the electron transport chain, it's going to pass those electrons to a water-soluble carrier. So plastocyanin is the chloroplast equivalent to cytochrome C. Okay. And just like cytochrome C, plastocyanin can only carry one electron at a time. This is a very similar process. Right? And it's just like in, in the electron transport chain, it passes it on to another complex. But unlike the other complex, in complex 4 here, we're not going to reduce O2 to water. That would undo what we were trying to do. We're extracting electrons. So here's where the similarities end. We're going to pass that electron onto photosystem 1. But at this point, it's been going downhill. So if you look at the graph at the bottom, we had light come in. And again, y-axis here is energy. Right, or instability. We had light come in and excite an electron to, from a ground state to an excited state. Then we passed it along going downhill eventually to photosystem 1. Right? And then photosystem 1 needs to be excited again. We've got to excite this electron again because it's at a low energy state. So yet another photon of light is accepted by photosystem 1. We're not going to extract any electrons from water this time. We're going to just excite the electron we've been given. So that photon excites the electron up to a high energy state again, and then it passes along several carriers one more time to another complex, right? And this ferredoxin NADP plus reductase complex, you could think of it as the equivalent to complex four, right? It's gonna pump some protons across the membrane for me, and then I'm gonna give the electrons not to O2, but to NADP plus to make NADPH. And that's shown up here at the top, okay? So the electrons travel this path shown by the solid black line. They start with water, that's our electron source. They pass through the membrane, then on the cytoplasm or the plastocyanin, water soluble side, then across this photosystem one, down to several carriers to NADP plus, which is going to be my electron sink. Okay. All the while, in several places, we're going to pump some protons across the membrane, and we'll create a proton gradient, just like before. Okay, so let's start with photosystem 2 and talk about it in detail. So just to remind you, so we see where we are along the way, keep this in mind that we don't want to lose track of the whole process while we're looking at the individual parts. The goal of photosystem 2 is to extract the electrons from water. Okay, so the goal here is use the light energy to remove the electrons from water. That's going to oxidize the water to O2. I'm going to eventually pass those electrons onto a lipid-soluble carrier Q. That's my goal. So how do we accomplish that? Okay, so shown at the, at the bottom here is a picture of photosystem 2. Right? So it's, it's got a lot of proteins involved. Uh, there's two major proteins called D1 and D2 that make up the bulk of the complex, but there's lots of other proteins at the bottom that do have specialized roles, which we won't get into too much. But in the middle of this is a special pair of chlorophylls, right? along with some other carriers we'll talk about, but a special pair of chlorophylls which all the other chlorophyll molecules around funnel the energy that they've collected. Okay. Ultimately, those parachlorophylls will serve to extract those electrons from water. And when we extract the electrons one at a time, we're going to pass them along to a molecule of Q. Now, how many electrons does Q carry at a time? If you remember from last time, it's going to be the same answer. Two. Two. Why can't we just give it one? I mean, you can. I'll prevent the semiquinone radical intermediate. Right. So if we only give it one and let it go, it's going to deprotonate and form the semiquinone radicals. Exactly. So let's not do that. We want to give it both electrons. But we can only extract one at a time from the water because one photon of light will do it. So we need to give it one, and then we need to give it a second, and then it can leave. So. We're going to play the game like we did last time. You remember with the, the trucks delivering the electrons and the guy in the canoe taking it away. 
we're going to play the same game. If we give it more than one place to put it, it's more stable. So a lot like that will happen here at Photosystem 2. Right? Except we're, we're reloading the trucks at this point. We're not unloading the trucks. Okay. So shown here again, we have our plastoquinone. Right? It accepts two electrons and two protons and becomes plastoquinol. We don't want to stop halfway and generate the radicals. Right? So we'll try to get it all the way to plastoquinol. Okay, so here's the reaction scheme for getting those electrons out of water. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on this one. I've shown it three different ways here so you can see what's going on. Uh, the figure in the bottom left is where we'll start with the, the really dark box. Okay? So this is generally where the photosystem is in its resting state, S1. Okay? So that's called the dark state. And if you leave it in the dark for a long enough time, this is where it will settle. It'll stop in this state. But before we get there, I want to back up one state to S0. Right? I want to start our, our discussion at S0. Although it really starts at S1 in the ground state of the resting plant, but it'll make more sense. You'll see why in a second to start at S0. Okay? So we're going to start over here at S0. This is where our two water molecules bind. Right? So we have our, our cluster of metals here with some oxygens in it, this cubane structure with four oxygens and three manganese and one calcium and then one manganese on the outside of it. So these, these five metal ions and four oxygens form this cluster, right? And it must be manganese. Manganese is the only metal capable of doing this, right? Iron will not work. Um, you use magnesium, it won't work. If you use nickel, it won't work. Cobalt won't work. All the other transition metals will not work. It must be manganese. And okay? we'll talk about why as we go through. Okay, so we have this cluster formed, right, and two water molecules bind. Now, be careful what you say in binding here and what you, what you draw, because I've adopted this figure from a textbook figure which misrepresented some of the things and had some errors in it, so I've corrected them. So here, if you see a solid line, that represents a covalent bond. If you see a dotted line, it's not a covalent bond, it's just an attraction or an association like a hydrogen bond. Okay, so if you see a solid line, it's a covalent bond. It's a shared pair of electrons. If you see a dotted line, that is not a covalent bond. Keep that in mind. Okay, so here on the left, we have two water molecules simply associating with the complex because of the, the partial negative charge of the oxygen. You know, it's got two lone pairs. And then the positively charged metal ions. So the first step, right, we have a photon of, of light come in okay, and extract an electron. Right, we'll get to the other two figures showing the photons in a second. But a photon of light comes in and extracts one electron. From which atom did I take the electron? Look carefully at S0 and S1 and tell me which atom lost that electron. Oxygen. Which oxygen? There's six of them there. Uh, the one on the manganese outside of the cube structure. So the water molecule's oxygen? Yes. The one on the left? Uh, yeah, yes. the bottom left. So the water molecule on the left, its oxygen atom, it has two lone pairs. One of those electrons has been removed. That's exactly right. And that's going to be the answer every time. We're going to pick on that oxygen atom all four times. So it's the same answer every time. All right, so we're taking an electron from this oxygen, and when we do so, it looks like I'm also losing a proton. Right? It deprotonates. Well, water deprotonating is not such a difficult thing to do. It has a pKa of 7. Right? So we lose an electron, and we lose a proton. What does that mean is left on the oxygen? Well, we still have the other hydrogen attached with its covalent bond. Right? There are two lone pairs there. If a proton leaves and one electron leaves, if I want to maintain those two lone pairs, what does the other electron do? What does it look like is happening? So both lone pairs are still there. Go ahead. Uh, sharing its electron with manganese to make another bond? Right, it's making a covalent bond with this manganese, right? The exterior manganese. So the proton left, one electron was extracted, and then the other electron forms a covalent bond. But it takes two electrons to form a covalent bond. 
So the manganese also contributes one of its valence electrons to make this covalent bond. So if the manganese contributes an electron, what happens to its oxidation state? It goes from plus three to what? It lost an electron. It's now part of a covalent bond. So it won't be a, a, a valence electron available to manganese anymore. It should go from plus three to what? Plus four. To plus four, exactly. So this is not shown in the figure here, but this manganese will be temporarily plus four. Okay, so now this should read plus four, one OH on it, and the other proton is gone. But it says plus three, which means somehow that manganese got its electron back, not necessarily the same one. Who contributed an electron to this manganese? Look at what else changed to the figure. The manganese in the bottom left corner of the cube. Yeah, the manganese at the bottom left of the cube, exactly. It went from plus three to plus four. It donated one electron to this one, right? They're in this cube structure, which allows them to do that. They stay in proximity to one another. So we've now ejected an electron and a proton, and we've moved an electron from this manganese to here, to this manganese. We've made a covalent bond here. Why is that stable now? Why does this happen? Because this electron had many places to move. It's got many other manganese here that can share that electron. They're all in the same cube structure, cubane structure. So it has many places to occupy, which makes it a more stable arrangement. If it were just a single manganese there, this would not be a very stable arrangement. Okay, okay so moving on to the next step, another photon of light comes in. We extract another electron from, guess who, same oxygen. So one of its lone pairs, right, loses an electron. And then we, of course, have to regenerate the lone pair. So where do we get the electron this time? Same answer. The manganese on the outside, the plus three manganese, donates one more electron to the oxygen. Well, that would make the manganese plus four again. But we have our, our cluster over here, which says we can help you out. This manganese at plus three can give its electron back to this one, making it plus three, and this one plus four. So now I have a cluster of four plus four manganese here. Right? I've extracted a two total electrons so far. This water molecule is still an OH on the manganese, and this one's still just associated with the calcium. Okay? So far, so good. A third photon comes in. It extracts a third electron from, yes, the same oxygen, and deprotonates it from, yes, the same oxygen. So we deprotonate, we lose that, we lose an electron, that means there's a single electron left here in this bond. Both lone pairs are still there. This single electron has to go somewhere, so it goes to form another bond to the manganese it's attached to. That makes this uh, one of the two electrons in the second, or pi bond here. The manganese can contribute the other for the third time and form a double bond, making it plus four. Now, it can't receive any more help from the cluster because they're all at plus four already. Right? So everybody stays at plus four. We're down here at S3 now. It's the S3 stage. So we have a plus four manganese double bonded to an oxygen. And we have another oxygen in a water molecule nearby. And for the fourth and last time, we're going to excite one more electron from this same oxygen, and it leaves again. So this is the fourth time we've extracted an electron, the fourth photon to show up, and we're going to lose one more electron from this oxygen. That leaves one, one unpaired electron. The manganese will do for the fourth time to contribute one electron to this oxygen, either to the oxygen or to a bond, but here it's to the oxygen. If I contribute an electron, that makes this manganese plus five, right? And it's stable because this plus five can be redistributed among the other manganese if possible. Right? But now I have a, a double bonded oxygen on a plus five metal. That makes it a nucleophilic target. Right? It's very difficult to do. And only manganese can accomplish this. Right? This is why we're using manganese. But now this oxygen is a nucleophilic target. It's an electrophile. Right? So this other oxygen says, I will attack you. Right? So this oxygen does a nucleophilic attack on another oxygen. That doesn't seem easy, but next to a plus five manganese it is. So we have one lone pair here attacking the oxygen, 
that's going to make a covalent bond between the oxygens, right? And at the same time, we deprotonate this water molecule, right? So this water molecule deprotonates. This pair can become a lone pair or do the attacking, right? So now I have an oxygen-oxygen single bond. That means this oxygen here can't have two lone pairs and three bonds. So one of its lone pairs goes on to the manganese. So we lose a bond from so the double bond here. Both of these go on to the manganese, giving the manganese two more electrons, making it go from plus five to plus three. Right, everybody with me on that one? We attacked here, we deprotonated. The lone pair that generates, uh, sorry, that attacks becomes a bond. There's two lone pairs still on the oxygen. The double bond becomes a single bond, and the, the electrons in that covalent bond go on to the manganese to go from plus five to plus three. Again, two valence electrons. Okay. Now we have a double bond between these, or a single bond between these oxygens. This is a peroxide at the moment. This is not a stable arrangement. So one more time, we can, we can donate some electrons. So in this case, we have a deprotonation here one more time. This hydrogen, or H plus, leaves. The bond between them becomes a double bond between oxygens, which is stable. And then the bond between the O, the original one we took all the electrons from, and the manganese 3 plus goes on to the manganese again to make it manganese plus 1 temporarily. So at that point, we could have our O2 leave. We have a proton leave. There it goes. And we have a manganese plus 1 sitting here. Well, that's not nearly as stable with all these plus 4s nearby. So the plus one manganese can donate its two electrons into the cluster. One will go on this manganese, and one will go on this one. And we back to where we started. This plus four will become a plus three. This plus four becomes a plus three. And this manganese plus one will go back to being plus three. Right? And the two more water molecules combine, and we start over. Right, so. Let's look at this whole pathway a little differently. Right, so it's the same thing's happening, so I'm describing the same thing. Just look at it on a different time scale. So looking at the, the right over here, it's called the Koch cycle. We're going to start at S0 once again, right? because that's where we have no photons coming in yet. Right, well, I know the resting state of, state of the cell will be at S1, but we're going to start at S0. So a photon of light comes in. right? We eject the electron and proton, just like this diagram shows and we make the S1 state, the state here. That occurs in about 30 microseconds. Okay. Then we have another photon of light come in, an ejected electron, just like it shows here. That occurs in about 70 microseconds. So these are fairly fast. From S2 to S3 takes 190 microseconds. So this is a, a long time compared to the others. And then S3 to S4 with another photon takes 200 microseconds. It's also a fairly long time compared to the first two. But the last step, that deprotonation event and the peroxide becoming O2, takes about 1.1 milliseconds. And if you put that in the same units, that's 1100 microseconds. So this is the longest step. So S4 to S0 is the slowest step. Right? Because it's not, it's not dependent on another photon of light. It's dependent on a peroxide becoming an O2. That's shown the same thing at the top, showing you all these steps, right? 1.1 milliseconds, 30, 70, 190, 200 microseconds. Which one is the fastest step? S0 to S1. Exactly, S0 to S1. So now you see why the cell or the, the chloroplast results in a, a, like a, a resting stage at S1 because that occurs so rapidly. It's very hard to stop at S0. So if you turn off the light, the last few photons of light get it to S1 because it's very fast, but it will not go all the way around because you run out of photons. Right? It'll only go as fast as the slowest step, which is S4 to S0, but that doesn't require any photons of light, so that's going to occur, the absence of light. But the last few photons will promote it to S1 because it's so rapid. Right? A few of those will go to S2, but then will decay back to S1. And that's also common. Right, so the resting state will be at S1, but we're going to start our discussion like we did at S0 because 
that's where you haven't had any photons of light come in yet. All right, the last thing to do with this slide is to talk about how long does this reaction complex last? It sounds like we're being very abusive to these, these manganese, right? We're making them do a lot of work, right? It takes about two milliseconds to go around this whole thing, right? Half of that time is spent just S4 to S0. So about two milliseconds to go all the way around. And in a 30-minute time frame, we'll do about a million turnovers. Right? So this reaction will turn over about a million times. It'll do this whole scheme a million times in about 30 minutes. And it's about that time frame, on average, that the complex will suffer some kind of oxidative event that will cause it to fall apart. We're doing some dangerous redox chemistry with radical electrons here. Right? Each of these steps is moving single electrons. So some of these times you're going to have an oxygen that becomes a radical. Right? And on average, about 30 minutes, they'll fall apart. Right? Some last longer, some last shorter. But about a million times doing this is about the average lifespan of one of these complexes. And it's going to have to be replaced. But keep in mind that each chloroplast also has millions of these. And each of the chloroplasts, they're abundant in the cell, thousands of them per cell, and millions of cells in the plant. So there's a lot of these to turn over and a lot of replacement going on. Okay, so here's the complex shown again in the center. And uh, I want to remind you at the bottom left, you see the, the box we had at S1, what it looks like. Where are all these players on the stage? So if you look at the complex on the bottom right, it's the whole thing embedded in the membrane where the proteins D1 and D2 and the many other accessory proteins and the whole antenna of chlorophylls shown as the green uh, line drawings. Removing all the proteins for a moment and just looking at the interior and seeing what's there is the picture in the center of the screen. All right, so looking at the, the branching network of chlorophylls and carotenoids and other things and there's a pheophyton molecule which is another mimic of chlorophyll just doesn't look exactly like chlorophyll. It's got the ring structure and everything. And then we have some cytochromes, and we have two Qs there, QA and QB. So QA and B are like the trucks docking at the warehouse, right? These Qs can leave, right? But I need two of them there because as I do this Coke cycle, right, S1 to S2 to S3 and S4 back to S0, and I extract one electron at a time, I have to put it somewhere. So I give one along the way, Right, this, this cluster, this manganese calcium cluster is shown here on the bottom left in colors. Right, the four manganese, the calcium, and the, the oxygens. Right, we transfer the electrons first to a tyrosine, then to another chlorophyll, the special pair of chlorophylls, to a pheophyton, and finally to QA. Also shown at the top is that same list from photosystem 2 to a pheophyton to QA to QB. Right, or QB to QA, either direction. Right, but I can store four electrons here, right? Because Q, A, and B each could hold one electron or two electrons. I'm giving them to them one at a time, but if they sit there and don't leave, I have a, more than one place to put that electron. I've got a QA, I've got a QB, an iron here, a couple of metals in the pheophytons, I've got a tyrosine, I've got lots of places to put these electrons until I accumulate a pair. Once I get a pair and they find their way onto the same truck, Q, A, or Q, B, it can leave. Right? Another empty truck can show up, and I keep doing this continuously. And pairs of electrons keep leaving as Qs. Right? The idea here is to not let the Q radical form. So I have a QA and QB gaining a pair of electrons. It's also going to pick up a pair of protons along the way and become QH2. Okay? Do you need to memorize this whole structure? Of course not. I want you to know there's a pathway to hold or store these electrons at the warehouse here before we can load two on a truck so it can leave without forming a radical. Okay, so once we have QH2 formed, it can go on down the chain in the membrane now. Remember, Qs are not soluble in water. And we'll pass them along to cytochrome BF. Okay. So cytochrome BF is the link between photosystem 2, which we just talked about, and photosystem 1, where the electrons are destined. Okay, so cytochrome BF it's just a small molecule, right? It's embedded in the membrane, not molecule, but protein. Embedded in the membrane. It's drawn like a little piece of bread here. And it accepts the trucks again, much like complex three did. It, two spinding places, right? So you can imagine it has the two docking sites here. 
and they can drop off their electrons one at a time and pass them along to a, a guy in a canoe once again, but this time it's called cytochrome BF, is giving the electrons to plastocyanin, right? Cytochrome BF is the complex of the big number three, right? Where the truck stock and the canoe, canoe show up. And plastocyanin is the version of the canoe. Maybe it's, it's uh, a kayak this time, if you want to call it something different. Okay, so plastocyanin can show up, but can only take one electron at a time, much like its counterpart in the mitochondrial tra electron transport chain. So just like before, one truck can dock, the other can bind as well. We give one electron to plastocyanin, it rows away, comes back, picks up another. We can store the other at multiple places until we can pass it along. So it's very, very similar to complex three. The difference here is plastocyanin is not like cytochrome C on the outside of the membrane, it's on the inside of the membrane. Right? Everything's kind of upside down, reversed here to the orientation. So it's going to be on the inside, not on the outside. And what this thing does, just like cytochromes, uh, just like a complex three did, it pumps protons. But instead of pumping them out, it pumps them in. So it pumps them to the same side that the next carrier is. Right? So in cytochrome uh, BF, we pump the protons into the thylakoid space, and that's where the next carrier is. In the case of the mitochondrial electron transport chain, we pumped it at complex three out of the membrane, and that's where my next cytochrome C was located. So we always pump them to the place where the next carrier is. Okay. So in that case, our, our plastocyanin picks up one proton, or sorry, one electron at a time and transports it over to photosystem one, okay, which is in the same membrane. Okay, so over at photosystem one, our plastocyanin delivers the electrons one at a time right, to the complex. And that's great that it delivers them one at a time because we can only excite one at a time. So it, it delivers it to photosystem one, a photon of light comes in, excites that one electron to a higher energy state, and then we hand it off to another carrier, right? A chlorophyll, which we know we carries one at a time, it hands it to a Q, which can carry two at a time. So the Q is going to hang on for a minute and wait until it gets a second one. A second one will finally get excited, hand it to a chlorophyll or a pair of chlorophylls, hands it to the Q again, and now we have two. Okay, then the quinone inside photosystem one, this is all happening inside the complex, hands it to an iron sulfur cluster. It's a four iron, four sulfur cluster. That sounds a lot like the ones we had in complex four. So we must be getting near the end of the chain because this is a place where they tend to not go backwards. Okay, So we hand it to a 4-iron, four 4-sulfur four cluster, which hands it to a molecule called ferrodoxin. Ferrodoxin shown here on the right in the orange color, right, with its 2-iron, two 2-sulfur two clusters. right, And then it hands it to ferrodoxin NADP plus reductase. That's a long name, but you can think of it as the analog to complex 4. Right? And it takes the electrons from ferrodoxin and gives them to NADP+. Right? NADP+, right, takes one electron and one proton, and then another electron, but not the other proton, right, and becomes NADPH. Right? And then, of course, the NADPH can dissociate, and we can have another NADP+, bind, and accept another pair of electrons and a proton. And this continues until we make a ton of NADPH, right? So it's very similar to what we did before, except we're not turning O2 into water, we're turning NADP plus into NADPH. That's the only difference here. Well, one of two differences. The other major difference is this ferrodoxin NADP plus, the analog of complex four, also pumps protons, but it pumps them again inside, not to the outside. Right, so putting all those together, we have what's happening is four photochemical steps to get the electrons away from the water. We need four photons to get those electrons out of water, right, to turn it into O2. But we're going to track a pair of electrons as they go through here. Okay, so I know we got four out of doing that. We're going to track a pair of electrons. Right? So you can imagine it's a continuous process. And so two photons would give me two electrons, but not two will give me two electrons in and of itself. It takes four to do the extraction completely, 
But in the process of doing the math here, I'm going to track a pair of electrons, like we've been doing for everything else. Okay, so a pair of electrons is, is moved to a higher energy state. We pass them along to the pheophytons, to the Qs, and finally to what's the mimic of, of complex three, cytochrome BF. We pump some protons into from the, from the stroma into the thylakoid space, so inside. Then we pass the electron to the soluble plastocyanin, which is also inside. It hands that pair of electrons one at a time to photosystem one. Photosystem one, as it gets them one at a time, excites them again with another photon of light for each electron, passes them along to a pair of chlorophylls, A0, A1, and so forth, another pair of Qs there at A1. And then we pass them to a series of iron sulfur clusters, a four iron, four sulfur cluster by itself, and then a two iron, two sulfur cluster in ferrodoxin. And then the analog to complex four, the thing in orange here, the ferrodoxin NADP plus reductase, the name should make sense. It tells you what it's oxidizing, followed by what it's reducing, followed by the name oxidoreductase. They just forgot to put the oxido part. You can if you want to. And then it gives those electrons to NADP plus to make NADPH. Along the way, we've pumped protons at three places, at the photosystem two, at the cytochrome BF and at ferrodoxin NADP plus reductase. Let me say that a little differently. We didn't actually pump protons at the photosystem two. We contributed to the gradient. Much like when I talked about complex four, it only pumped two protons, but it did consume two to make the water molecule. Similar things going on at photosystem two. I'm consuming two protons there, right? I'm not pumping them across per se, but I'm removing them from the matrix, not matrix, but the uh, stroma when I made the QH2. So I've contributed to the gradient without actually pumping anything, if that makes sense. Okay. But cytochrome BF actually pumps protons, and then the ferrodoxin NADP plus reductase actually pumps protons. All these protons are being pumped inside. Okay, so a lot of times this is called the, the photosynthesis Z scheme because of the, the way the, the diagram is drawn. It looks like a set of Zs with these zigzag lines. But keep in mind that we're always trying to raise the energy of the electrons, that's what this y-axis is, with the photon of light. So photons come in and raise the energy of the electron. We send it down the gradient, downhill, a gradient of energy, right? So more electropositive until we get to a point where we can't go any lower. And then at photosystem one, we pump it up again with another photon and send it down a gradient again. And we arrive at NADPH. So overall, our electrons went from water, which was over here in the energy scale, to NADPH, which is higher in the scale. That has a free energy difference of a plus, or a delta G of a positive 18.9. So how do we go uphill? Because of the input of the photon energy. It allows me to make this possible. Right? Without the photons adding energy to the system, we can't get from water to NADPH. All right, so when did this start? When did we start doing photosynthesis? Well, about two billion years ago, this started. I mean, that's a really rough estimate. Right? It wasn't one billion years ago, and it certainly wasn't three billion years ago. So it's a rough estimate around two billion years ago that oxygenic photosynthesis started happening. Right? What evidence do we have that this occurred? Right? So we weren't around then, we don't know. So how do we know we started producing, or organisms started producing oxygen? Well, if you had an early Earth, it was a very reducing environment. Right? There was a lot of methane in the atmosphere, there was a lot of nitrogen, there, was, there wasn't a lot of oxygen. In fact, there was very little at all. So what happens when an organism starts producing O2? Well, immediately in its environment, it would oxidize the first thing it encounters. Right? So it oxidizes all the gases in the atmosphere first. If there were any, ox any, any molecules that could be oxidized readily. Then it would start oxidizing things in the ocean, right? because oxygen will dissolve into water. And there was a lot of iron in the ocean. So the iron was oxidized first. So it went from being an iron-rich ocean to oxidize all that iron. It becomes rust and it settles out of the ocean. And then you have a clearer ocean. Well, that's to the liking of these organisms that are using light energy to do this. The light will not penetrate farther down in the water. So the photosynthesis is expanding and getting more pronounced. The downside to this is if 
you finally get rid of all the iron in the oceans and all the rocks on land absorb all the iron and become rust, then the O2 starts to build up in the atmosphere. And that's bad news for a lot of organisms because they're not used to this toxic molecule. Right? So most of them die out. Only those that find a way to combat this oxidative environment, they come up with antioxidants, right? like some of our vitamins, then they can contribute to this or they can live through this. Also, they finally develop, if this occurred before or after the onset of O2, we're unsure, there's, there's a rationale for both, that mitochondria started using the O2. They may have existed prior to this and used a different source, like sulfur, right, instead of O2. But they are now becoming part of multicellular and, and eukaryotic organisms, using them as a, a organelle to survive the O2 and actually use it to their advantage. And so most of organisms were wiped out, and now we have all this excess O2 in the atmosphere, and it builds up until we finally get O2 in the upper atmosphere, and then UV radiation, which doesn't make its way to the surface nearly as well as visible light, but it interacts with the O2 in the upper atmosphere to form an ozone layer, which is even more protective of letting UV not get to the surface. And thus, organisms can come out of the water, which was also protective, and live on land. So O2 production was fairly important in the evolution of land, life on land. Okay? But it's not the only source. We can use things other than water to make O2, right? So, or to make photosynthesis happen. We can use H2. H2 would be oxidized to just water as well, or hydroxides, right? We could use S sulfurs. Sulfurs would become uh, H2S as our product. Right? Or, or a donor, and we could make S2 as a dangerous byproduct. So these are non-oxygenic forms of photosynthesis. But the most common one now on the surface where oxygen has been produced is the cyanobacteria, and of course plants, where we make O2 as the byproduct. Okay, so the goal of photosynthesis is not to make O2 for you. Plants do not have you in mind. They never have. Right? And cyanobacteria have never had a mitochondria in mind to doing this. It's a byproduct. It's a waste product. Other life has developed to use that waste product. Okay. So here's a, a gradient of the whole thing showing you where it happens. So we start over here at photosystem two, right? Shown by the, uh, the like gray, blue, and red pill thick looking thing here, right? So photon energy is used to extract electrons from water to make O2. The O2 is free to leave as a gas. Ultimately, those electrons are passed on to Q to make the quinol, the QH2. At the same time, it looks like it says pumping protons across the membrane here. That's kind of a misnomer. But we are removing protons from the stroma. All right, so we're contributing to the gradient of having more protons inside than outside. We're not technically pumping any, but we're consuming some protons to make the QH2. So we've removed them from the stroma. Right? That's the stroma outside. So there's an there's a increase in the gradient of protons between the lumen, which is the interior, thylakoid space, we call it the lumen when it's inside, and the stroma outside. Right? So those electrons are, are passed on to the cytochrome BF here in the center. Remember, this is our, our analog to complex three. It passes them to the analog of the soluble carrier, which is plastocyanin, pumps a couple protons inside. The plastocyanin sends it over to, to photosystem one, which is this yellow looking pill, right? More light energy is absorbed. We pump the electrons up to a higher energy, pass them along to a few carriers, ultimately to NADP plus to make NADPH, which will also consume protons from the stroma, again, contributing to the gradient. Ultimately, the excess protons inside are let back out, which we've seen this before. It's just it's upside down to us, to convert ADP to ATP. This is identical to ATP synthesis as we did in the mitochondria, except it's in the other direction. Okay, so the main difference is here is everything's orientation to the membrane is reversed. We pump inside, not out. We make the ATP by letting the protons out, not in. The convenient part of this is the ATP and the NADPH are made outside this watertight membrane, so we don't have to export them. So if you think of it in terms of our analogy, it's three protons to assemble, but there's no shipping charge. It's already outside. It's like chloroplasts have uh, Amazon Prime. You don't have to pay shipping. Whereas mitochondria, the old-fashioned way, you got to pay to ship it. 
Okay. Okay, so let's look at it a little differently. Let's say we start the process at photosystem 2, generate some electrons, send them down the chain to Q, they bring them on to photosystem 1, but then we turn photosystem 2 off. We shut it down. We don't need any more electrons. What are we going to do with the ones we have? Well, we're not going to give them to NADP+. That's the idea here. So we're going to follow the pathway, but we're not going to give those electrons to NADP+. So if I go back a slide, so we get to this point right here. We've passed the electrons to Q, to cytochrome BF, to plastocyanin, onto photosystem 1, all the way up to the ferrodoxin, but we don't give them to NADP+. We want to give them right back to the photosystem 1. Okay, so why do such a thing? Okay, so here's a way of looking at that on the right. So we excite our, photon, our electrons at photosystem 1. We send the electron down the pathway through all those a1, A, A0, A1 to ferrodoxin, the iron sulfur clusters, to cytochrome BF, but we don't give it to NADP+. We give it right back to plastocyanin, who can hand it back to photosystem 1. Right? And of course, we can excite it again. So you see we have a cyclic nature of this electron. We never lose that electron. We can keep cycling it. We keep exciting it by the photon energy and sending it to this the cyclic pathway. What does it accomplish? Well, it certainly doesn't make NADPH because we never give it to it. But it does keep pumping protons at cytochrome BF because I give it back to plastocyanin. Right? So I keep pumping protons across the membrane. I keep contributing to the proton gradient. I can keep making ATP, but I'm not making any, any NADPH. So this is when the cell is in the state of, I still need ATP, but I don't need to make any more NADPH right now. We've got plenty of reducing molecules around. So let's just do this cyclic flow through photosystem 1 and turn photosystem 2 off, right? Which means I'm not going to produce any O2 byproducts, which is safer. But I don't need any NADPH right now, but I am still making ATP. This is actually more efficient than using both systems because I'm recycling the same electron. I'm only using one photon of energy to keep producing this instead of having to have two. Okay, so this is when the cell will go through this pathway when it has a need for ATP, but not a need for NADPH. So I don't always have to make both. Okay, so let's look at that overall system and compare to the, the straight chain or the linear photosynthesis versus the cyclic photosynthesis we just talked about. So in the linear pathway, we need a total of eight photons. Makes one O2. Right? So four of those photons will remove the electrons from water, from a pair of water molecules, to make O2. And then as those four electrons go through the system, they each get excited again at photosystem one, thus the other four photons, making eight. And we pass those four electrons onto two NADP pluses to make two NADPHs and we make three ATP molecules. Okay. And why three ATPs? Because that's a pumping of enough protons to generate a gradient of nine, and we nine, AT, nine protons come across, make one turn of ATP synthase, and I get three ATPs. No shipping needed. Right. I know the reaction at the top says 10 or 12, but it's not 100% efficient. Just like with the mitochondria, there's some loss in the system and we'll only get three ATPs, not four. Okay, So it takes about 2.67 photons per ATP, if you think about it that way. But in the cyclic form, I'm not removing electrons from water. I had to initially, we'll get it started, but now we're just going to cycle that one electron over and over and over at photosystem one. I'm not going to make any NADPH, but I'll make a lot of ATP at the yield of two photons per ATP. That's much more efficient use of the photon energy, but I do not get any NADPH. So it can switch to between linear and cyclic forms depending on the needs of the cell. Okay, we'll talk about what we're going to do with those NADPHs and ATP in a few minutes. All right, so looking at the, the membrane at the bottom, the diagram of the, the thylakoid membrane at the bottom, this is the same membrane, everything keeps crossing that we're talking about, the important one. We have photosystem 1, photosystem 2, cytochrome BF, and ATP synthase. All these things are located in the membrane. 
Now there's cues in here as well, but those are lipid soluble, so they can make their way pretty much anywhere in the membrane. But these complexes are sort of fixed in place. They do tend to, to migrate and flow along with the bulk of the membrane, but they don't really move as readily as Q does. So they kind of stay in their areas. So if you look at the thylakoid membrane, parts of it were stacked. If you go back and look at the anatomy of the thylakoid or anatomy of the, the chloroplast slide, you see there were some areas that were highly stacked on themselves, highly folded. That's where you're going to find the bulk of photosystem too. Right? It's also where you're going to find very little photosystem one. And so this is stacked because as light goes through, if you stack up a bunch of these membranes, it's much more likely to hit a photosystem antenna if you stack the membranes on itself. On itself. If you only make a few layers and not this big stack, the light going through the leaf or through this particular chloroplast has a lesser chance to actually hit one of these chlorophyll or carotenoid molecules. So they stack them up to give them a better chance. Okay. The ATP synthase, you notice, is also not located very abundantly in the stacks. Right? The reason for that is there's very little volume in the stack. They're stacked on top of each other. The inner interior space, right, the thylakoid space or the thylakoid lumen, all the same thing, is very little volume in there. Right? So you want to have the protons be concentrated in here and flow outward into the other areas. Right? So they flow out into the side areas. Right? So there's a general flow of protons out towards the side or protons along here to the sides and then they export through or exit through ATP synthase on the sides. If ATP synthase were in the stacks, there would be no room for the head groups and the ATP being made would be difficult to get out of those stacked areas. It doesn't have to cross the membrane, but if you imagine making it in here, right, it would be very difficult to get it out of there. It's not a lot of volume. Okay? So that's why it's only abundant in the less stacked regions. All right, let's move on to the Calvin cycle, which is the second half of photosynthesis. So everything we've done so far, we generally call the light reactions. Not because they happen in the bright light, although they do, it's because they require photons of energy, right? So they require the presence of photons for them to occur. The Calvin cycle, which is the next part of photosynthesis, is generally termed the dark reactions of photosynthesis. That does not mean they happen only in the dark. That is not a true statement at all. They happen all the time. They just don't require further input of photons. Right? Just like uh, glycolysis would be called dark reactions because they don't require the input of light energy. Right? Just as equivalent to call them dark reactions. The reason they call dark here is to distinguish it from those that precursor reactions that do require photons. Don't think the dark reactions happen at night and the other parts happen during the day. It's not that broken down. The, the light reactions of photosynthesis require photons of energy. So yes, it has to have a light source. But the dark reactions happen all the time, as long as their substrates are available. Okay? And the substrates for it will be the very things we just made in the light reactions, which be ATP and NADPH. The other substrate would be CO2, which is also always present. Right, in the atmosphere. So those are always going to be around. If a cell runs out of ATP and NADPH, it's going to be dead. Right? There's no need to wait till tomorrow morning for light. You won't last that long. The cell never really runs out of ATP. Right? So when you run out of light energy during the day and you're moving on to the evening and night, the plant will make ATP other ways. It has mitochondria as well. Right? Or if you're a photosynthetic bacteria, you also have the electron transport chain in your membrane, much like mitochondria do. Right. Okay, so the Calvin cycle starts out with a molecule called ribulose 5-phosphate. So if you look up here at the top, the very center, the top of this, the cycle, it's ribulose 5-phosphate. And it should remind you of another molecule. Okay. What molecule does ribulose 5-phosphate mimic if it were but one carbon longer? So if ribulose 5-phosphate were one carbon longer, what would it be? Uh, 
What was that? Fructose 6-phosphate. It would be fructose 6-phosphate, exactly. So it looks exactly like fructose 6-phosphate. It's just one carbon shorter. The phosphate's on the very end. It's a ketose sugar, and it has five instead of six carbons. So otherwise, it's the same thing. What did we do to fructose 6-phosphate? What was our very next step in glycolysis? Phosphorylated. We phosphorylated it. Which OH on which carbon did we put it on? The first one. The first one, right? Remember, because you put it to its ring form and it was the one available. Number six was already occupied. We're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to put this phosphate on available carbon number one. So we have a kinase here that puts a phosphate on ribulose 5-phosphate to make ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. It's the mimic of PFK1. It works exactly the same way, right? Except we're doing it with a five carbon molecule instead of six, no big deal, right? The next step is the very unique step to photosynthesis in the, the Calvin cycle or dark reactions. Here's where we use the CO2. We're gonna use an enzyme that puts the CO2 onto ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. Now, if you had to guess, where is the CO2 going to be put on this, this molecule? What looks like a good target? Which of the five carbons looks like the best target? So is it the carbonyl? Yeah, it's always the carbonyl, right? So the number two carbon is where we're going to attach that CO2. If you put a CO2 on there, we're going to create a situation that might sound familiar. What type of arra arrangement would we have? It's a very unstable arrangement. Beta keto. We're going to make a beta keto, exactly. So just like we've seen before, if we make a beta keto, the easiest way to resolve it is to usually lose something, right? But this enzyme won't let us lose the same CO2 we put on. That would be wasteful. So what we're going to do is break the carbon chain in half. This looks a lot like what we've seen before. Remember step four of glycolysis? The very next step was to have the molecule get a divorce from itself. We're going to do the same thing. Except because we're adding a CO2 this time, we've added a carbon at a much more oxidative state than we were with the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Right? We only had one carbonyl there. So we ended up with a couple of aldehydes or aldehyde and a ketone. Here, because we're adding a more oxidized carbon and then cutting it in half, we're going to end up with two carboxyl groups, right? two phosphoglycerates. We've seen these molecules before. They occurred later in glycolysis. It was three phosphoglycerate. We're going to get a pair of those. And then we can take three phosphoglycerate and turn it into one three bisphosphoglycerate. We've seen that reaction before. It's the exact same one from glycolysis. Right? We're just adding a phosphate. Right? This is identical to the one we do in glycolysis. Right? So we're going to add a phosphate to it and make it 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Right? And at that point, instead of doing the rest of glycolysis, because I don't need to do that right now, I don't need ATP right now, I'm using my ATPs to synthesize a sugar so I can save it for later, we're going to reduce that carboxylate. Right? So I have a 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, and I'm going to reduce it right, down to the aldehyde stage. So we're going to reduce the 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate to a glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So the phosphate we just put on makes for a good leaving group, so we let it go, and at the same time, reduce the molecule down to an aldehyde. All right? If I have a 3-phosphoglycerate, I know you, you already know you can take a pair of those, turn one into the the ketone stage, right, the dihydroxyacetone phosphate, and then a pair of those in reverse aldolase in an aldol reaction could be turned into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, and then we dephosphorylate it to fructose 6-phosphate. That's what's shown in this figure. That's just doing gluconeogenesis at the end. And then I'm leaving it as a little hand-waving exercise for a second. It just says stage 3 regeneration. We're going to talk about it. But stage 3 regeneration here, 
turns a fructose 6-phosphate back into the ribulose 5-phosphate I started with. And now you're thinking, what was the point? I spent a bunch of ATP and a bunch of NADPH, I got a CO2 just to lose it in the end. I went from six carbons back to five. Well, if we did that, that would be completely a waste of time. So the stage three regeneration isn't that simple. What I'm really gonna do is if you can imagine, I have six of these reactions happening simultaneously. Six ribulose five phosphates becoming six ribulose one five bisphosphates. And all the way through, I do six equivalent cycles right here. I'm gonna end up with six fructose six phosphates, okay? I'm gonna take five of those fructose six phosphates. Really quickly, tell me how many carbons that is. Five six carbon things would be how many carbons? Thirty. Thirty carbons. I could turn five six carbon sugars into six five carbon sugars. That's still thirty carbons. And I have one leftover fructose six phosphate. That's what they're showing here. So I do this for six molecules at once. Five of those end up going back to replenish the, the ribulose five phosphates, the all six of them I started with, and I get one extra fructose from the process. So I have to do six rounds of this Calvin cycle simultaneously to get one sugar produced, one six carbon sugar produced. Okay, so let's look at the steps of this real quick. Right? It's, it's a lot of things you've seen already and a few new ones. So the first step is very simple. We turn the ribulose 5-phosphate into ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. You already know how that happens. We just phosphorylate it, much like PFK1 did. Okay? So here we're going to have a CO2 attach itself to the carbonyl carbon, just like you suspected. And that makes a very unstable beta-keto intermediate. The most likely thing it will do is decarboxylate right because it's unstable but we don't want that to happen so instead we have a water molecule come in right and break the carbon carbon bond between carbons what were two and three it's now three carbons at the top and three carbons at the bottom we're going to break this bond right here in the center with a water molecule okay so we prevent that decarboxylation step okay once we cut these in half we're going to end up with uh, a OH binding to this side and an H to this side, and I get two identical three phosphoglycerates. If you look at the top three carbons, it will be a phosphoglycerate, because this just gets an H, and this gets an OH, which would also be a phosphoglycerate. Right? So I get two identical molecules, two isomers, or not isomers, but two identical three phosphoglycerates. They have the same formula. Okay? The enzyme that does this is called Rubisco, okay? and it's the most abundant protein on the planet. Right, by far, nothing even close to second place. Right? It's a very slow reaction. Now, when I say slow, you know what I mean. I don't mean the chemistry step is very slow. I mean it's a very infrequent reaction. Okay? This doesn't happen on a, a rapid scale. This enzyme takes a long time to, to do several reactions. Okay? So here I'm talking about very frequent, infrequent. It requires the formation of a carbamate. Right, in, the, in, the, in the process. So a carbamate is not very stable. Right? So making this carbamate is what makes it a very infrequent in reaction. So another way to talk about this has a very large activation energy. Okay? Uh, magnesium iron is required for activity. It can also use manganese. It can use iron. It can use others, but or magnesium works the best. Right? And it's used to activate the CO2 because catching this gas, catching the CO2 is the slow step. Right? And you probably remember from reactions you've seen that decarboxylation reactions are, are generally irreversible. We're trying to do exactly the opposite of that. We're trying to carboxylate something. Right? And that's why it's a very slow reaction. And we're not kind of trying to catch it as bicarbonate, we're trying to catch it as CO2. So that's difficult. Plants have found ways around this. You've probably heard of C3 versus C4 plants. C4 plants temporarily store that extra CO2 as oxaloacetate. They put it on a pyruvate. And they store it in the cell as high concentration of oxaloacetate. And then when the CO2 starts to drop, they release the CO2 by spontaneously letting the oxaloacetate decarboxylate, right, in a little pouch inside the cell. So inside the, the leaf. So when it decarboxylates, the concentration of CO2 has gone up, right? So in areas where CO2 is lower, like in deserts, right, they have this C4 pathway that they do. 
Okay, so here's our, our reaction scheme on the right, how this takes place. We have a, a amino acid as part of the enzyme. It's a lysine side chain. We carboxylate it to make a carbamate. The carbamate is stabilized by the mag or magnesium here. Okay. Without the magnesium and without this lysine, we wouldn't able, be able to do this. Okay. And this allows the CO2 to then attack the carbon, to then attack the carbonyl of my fructose, or sorry, not fructose, but ribulose, 1,5-bisphosphate. So that's stage one, to make that extra carbon attached to the, the ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. We get a six carbon molecule that's unstable. We break it apart using a water molecule into two, three phosphoglycerates. Now you know you can turn those into anything you want, right? We turn them into glucose, we turn them into glucose 1-phosphate, fructose 6-phosphate. They were in the glycolytic or gluconeogenic pathways, okay? So this is going to be like the gluconeogenic pathway from here on, except we're going to use NADPH, not NADH. This is an anabolic pathway, right? I know gluconeogenesis was also anabolic, but that's a basic pathway that's it used NADH because that reaction, number six, was reversible. So no need to reinvent the wheel. Here, it's a different reaction, so we're going to use NADPH in this anabolic pathway. In bacteria, it is still NADH. Okay. So here's what we could do with it. We take our, our three phosphoglycerate at the bottom. We phosphorylate it. That's a phosphoglycerate kinase to make the 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Looks like a gluconeogenic enzyme. And then this one's like it, but it's different because we use NADPH and turn it into the glyceraldehyde state. So we reduced it. These NADPH from photosynthesis, ATP from photosynthesis, we're using them now, supplies the reducing electrons to turn it into the, the aldehyde. We turn one of the two aldehydes into the ketone, and then together we can form the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. This is all using our normal glycolysis and gluconeogenesis enzymes. At this point, we use our bisphosphatase to cut it off and leave a single one, and all these are interchangeable. Right? This is the uh, fructose 6-phosphate to glucose 6-phosphate. We can turn glucose 6-phosphate into glucose 1-phosphate. We haven't talked about it yet, but we will in our next lecture. That's how we get to our glycogen synthesis. But these are interconvertible hexose monophosphates. So we call it a hexose monophosphate pool. Six carbon sugars with a phosphate. Okay? The overall reaction we've done is we took six CO2s. We had to do this six times. We took 18 ATPs to do this. Right, three per CO2 to get it here. We took two NADPHs per CO, per CO2 to get here because you have to do this twice for two molecules. We consumed 12 water molecules, right? One in the first step and one in this later step to cut it in half. And it makes one six carbon sugar. So this is quite expensive, but we're in a well-fed state, well-illuminated state. So we can spend our ATP in an NADPH. Okay. And then the lastly is our pentose phosphate shunt. So I'll go through this rather quickly because it's really easy. Uh, a lot of books will spend a lot of time explaining all these steps, but it's a very simple process. What we're doing is taking our six carbon sugars, right, either in the glucose state or the fructose state, doesn't make any difference, we can interconvert them. And we do one of two things. Right? The first thing I want to talk about is how to turn it directly back into ribose 5-phosphate or ribulose 5-phosphate. We can take our glucose 6-phosphate right, and immediately turn it into ribulose 5-phosphate by doing a couple things to it. We can lose a carbon. What's missing from this picture is the carbon we lost. So we went from 6 carbons to 5, so there should be a CO2 leaving here. So that's kind of wasteful. We turn it into to ribulose 5-phosphate, and we do that by oxidizing it twice. Right? So glucose into ribulose is a two-step oxidation. So we need two NADPHs, or NADP pluses, to accept the electrons to make NADPH. All right, so we got our NADPHs back, but we get a CO2 out of this. Right? That's not the goal. The goal was to make the ribulose. This is the oxidative phase of the regeneration. Right? We don't get any extra sugars out of this. We're just turning it back into ribose. So what do we get out of that? We get some five carbon sugars. We get some NADPHs back. So if the cell needs those things, we do that. The other stage, the non-oxidative stage, is something different. Here I want to get a net glucose or a net sugar out of it. So I wrote the result at the bottom. It's very simple for you in this, this color scheme down here. 
So I know this looks complicated, but look at the color scheme I wrote down here. We're going to take six five carbon sugars, right, and turn them into five six carbon sugars. Right? How do we do that? Well, I'm going to take three five carbon sugars and make it into two six carbon sugars and a three carbon sugar. So this is a total of 15 carbons. I'll we'll make two six carbon sugars, that's 12 carbons, and a three carbon sugar left over, that's a total of 15. I do that twice, that's like taking six five carbon sugars and making four six carbon sugars and a pair of three carbon sugars. I just multiplied everything times two. But the pair of three carbon sugars, you know, can be turned into a six carbon sugar. So effectively, I've turned six five carbon sugars into five six carbon sugars. Total of 30 carbons became 30 carbons. And what I can do there is I can do this in reverse. I could also take five six carbon sugars, you see them in blue here, and go backwards and make six five carbon sugars. I don't lose any carbons this way. In the oxidative phase, yes, I lose the carbon. All that effort to put it on and I lose it. But if that's what I need, that's what I need. Here I'm not losing any carbons. So I do take the six carbon sugars, the five of them I've made, and turn it back into six five carbon sugars. I can replace the five I borrowed to start the processes, and I have one extra carbon or one extra sugar left over. Showing that in detail here, I boxed everything in red to help you out. We're going to start with the red and end up with the blue and green. So I take a ribose. 5-phosphate, right, and a xylulose 5-phosphate, which is a conversion from ribose to xylulose. It's an isomer of it. So I just convert one ribose into a xylulose. Still has five carbons, still has a phosphate on it. Nothing else has changed. But I take a pair of those. How many total carbons are here? Ten. How many total phosphates are here? Two, right, one on each sugar. So they combine, and I get two sugars. Instead of having five and five carbons, they have seven and three. Very simple. I just transferred two of these onto this one. So this went from five to seven. This goes from five to three. Very simple. Just a transfer. Right? I'll leave the details of the transfer for another class. But five and five became seven and three. That's all you need to know. And then I do the same type of switch. Instead of having seven and three, I end up with six and four. What happened? Right? You can't transfer one carbon, but I can transfer three carbons. I transferred two in this step. I can transfer three in this step. So two from the xylulose went to the ribose, right? And now I have seven and three. And now I take three from the seven carbon one, leaving four, give it to the three, leaving six, or create making six. So I'm just playing hot potato with carbons here. Five and five become seven and three. Seven and three become four and six. And there's one of my six carbon sugars. Wonderful. The four I have left over combines with yet another five carbon sugar. So this is my three five carbon sugars I was showing you. Here's the third one, right? So four and five become three and six. I do the same type of thing. I transfer two carbons, right? So I transfer two from the five to the four. That makes six. And the five losing two becomes three. So what did I get out of it? I used three five carbon sugars, as I said over here. I get two six carbon sugars and one three carbon sugar. That's what I wrote over here. If I do this twice, I'll end up with four six carbon sugars, a pair of these, and a pair two three carbon sugars. Both of those glyceraldehyde three phosphates could be combined, right, using gluconeogenesis to make yet another fructose six phosphate. Right, that's exactly what we've done. Showing the the Back here again, this step up here is what I'm talking about now. The glucose to ribulose, this is the, the non-beneficial stage, the oxidative stage. Why do this? I can take glucose, right, oxidize it once to gluconolactone, right? You see what I've, I've changed. I turned this alcohol into a ketone, right? And then I use a water molecule to open it up, right? And then I oxidize it one more time, right? This CO2 leaves, and I oxidize the carbon number two, to an aldehyde, which moves over to number two, what will be number two, to a ketone, and I get my ribulose, and there's my CO2 that left. All I get out of this is a pair of NADPHs again. So if the cell needs a lot of ribulose 5-phosphate, or 5-carbon sugars, perhaps we're dividing, right? We need a new DNA, a new RNA. We need a lot of these 5-carbon sugars. 
right? So if a plant cell or a bacterial cell was doing this, let's use this pathway. What if we're not dividing so much? We don't need all these five carbon sugars, but I do need a lot of sugar in general, six carbon sugars. Maybe I'm making new um, membranes and I need my sugar molecules attached to them. Then I don't do this pathway, I do the other pathway where I exchange six for five. All right, so I have two modes depending on what the cell needs. So here's the non-oxidated one shown one more time. It's the same picture. I'm exchanging five and five to seven and three. Two were transferred to the other one. Then I transfer three from the seven, two to three to make six. Seven minus three leaves me with four. Then I take the four, a third five carbon sugar enters the pathway, four and five. I take these two and transfer two from the five to the four to make six. The five transferred two, leaving three and I have a six and a three carbon sugar. Repeat this whole pathway for yet another three starting materials. I get the same three products. That's gonna be four six carbon sugars, two three carbon sugars, which could combine to make a fifth six carbon sugar. Okay. This is another graphic showing that exact same thing, so you can see it all at once. Here's my three five carbon sugars, right, creating the two six carbon sugars, and one three carbon one. Identically on the bottom, three fives creating two sixes and a three. The two threes combine to make the fifth of the five six carbon sugars created from six five carbon sugars. So if you remember, we start with a net of 30 carbons, we end up with a net of 30 carbons, you get the idea. This is entirely reversible. I could start with the five six carbon sugars and make six five carbon sugars if I wanted to. And I don't lose any CO2s that way. Or if I need to keep my NADPHs, I could do it with the oxidative pathway and turn the six carbon sugars directly into five carbon sugars by losing the CO2, keeping my NADPHs. This way, consumed all those NADPHs during photosynthesis to make these sugars. Depends what the cell needs.